sing together tonight, He Keeps Me Singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This could fill my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go, feasting on the riches of his grace, resting beneath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. Good evening. Welcome back to our evening service. Uh, as always, glad you are with us tonight. Let me give you just a couple of announcements. Uh, don't forget, Joy Group uh, will be leaving from the church at 5.30 this Tuesday to go over to Males in Smithville. So please keep that in mind. Don't forget deacons. We will have a deacons meeting next Sunday afternoon at 4.30 down in the Family Life Center. Uh, school out bash, or schools out bash, excuse me, uh, will be this Wednesday the 24th, and that's going to start at 6 o'clock rather than 6.30, so please remember that. And uh, kids night out Friday, May the 26th for grades 1 through 6, um, and there is information uh, I'm sure that has been given to parents for that. So just keep that in mind as well. And lastly, don't forget, there's going to be a weight loss, uh, the weight loss challenge. Uh, there's going to be a meeting for that next Sunday night after service. Uh, and this will be men or women, men and women both. So uh, there's going to be some information given about that. All right, let's have our ushers come forward and we'll receive our evening offering. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Uh, thank you, Lord, for service this morning and speaking to our hearts through your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for um, the, the hands that went up, Lord, and the hearts that you're dealing with and the lives you're dealing with. And we just pray, Lord, that you continue to uh, deal with those, Lord, and, and bring them to yourself. Uh, Lord, we pray tonight as we've gathered together, Lord, that you'd be honored and glorified in all that we do through the songs we sing. Uh, through this offering now, Lord, we pray your blessings. And Lord, we, how we pray your blessings on your word tonight. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
sing the lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to the lily of the valley, the bright and morning sun. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn from my heart and now he keeps me in his power. All the world forsake me and Satan tempt me through. Though Jesus, I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. me, I've nothing now to fear, with his manna he my hungry soul shall fill, then sweeping up to glory I'll see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever be, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. If you have your Bibles, be turning with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. We are going to work our way through the chapter tonight. Um, we should be able to get through the whole thing. Uh, so I need you to fill in the blank. Somebody fill in the blank. Blank comes before destruction. Blank comes before destruction. Pride. That comes from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Um, tonight we're, we're, we're going to see pride uh, and what can happen with someone who is prideful. Uh, and that's what Daniel chapter 4 is. C.S. Lewis called pride the great sin he went on to say in Mere Christianity, he said, There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians uh, ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious in ourselves. And, more, and the more we have it uh, ourselves, the more we dislike it, in others, um, pride. Now, God, uh, it's, it's pretty rare that you see these terms, but, but you see it here, that God hates pride. And that's the word that is used. Proverbs chapter 6, uh, 16 through 19 says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him, and the very first thing He mentions is pride. He uses the word haughty eyes. Uh, but it's, the idea is pride. What is pride? What is it? Since, we, since it's so bad and we don't need it, so what is it? Uh, I like how Dr. David Jeremiah puts it. He says, pride is an exaggerated and dishonest self-evaluation. It's, when we, uh, it's when, uh, when we want people to believe something about us even though we know it isn't true or is at best a gross inflation of some self-perceived virtue. 
Pride seeks value, honor, importance, reputation, and significance that isn't deserved. Pride is an ego-motivated maneuver to hide from ourselves and others the truth about our inner reality. Pride. Uh, pride, where does pride come from? Since it's bad and we don't need it and we shouldn't want it, where does pride come from? Well, the truth is it comes from within. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, now catch this, Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, Pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So that, that goes back to kind of what we, we saw a little bit this morning as we looked at some things. But the, 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 the fact that we're sinners and because we are sinners, our hearts are wicked. And because our hearts are wicked, out of that wickedness comes those things that Jesus just mentioned in Mark chapter 7. So, so we're, we're born in sin and yet we choose to sin. It goes both ways. Um, now in Daniel chapter 4, what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 4 is the fall of a prideful man. And that is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, but what we do see also is uh, what we're going to see at the end, in the beginning and at the end really, uh, is, is the grace of God. We see the mercy of God. And we see how God can uh, restore a man who has fallen in pride. And so I hope at the end when we look at some application for us uh, that we find hope if there's someone that we know that needs salvation or if we know that there is someone who uh, uh, needs to rededicate, recommit themselves to Christ, uh, I hope at the end of this we will see hope for those people. Uh, so, uh, so Daniel chapter 4, and again, we're just going to kind of walk ourselves through the text. Uh, the context of Daniel chapter 4 uh, is this is Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. The first one was in Daniel chapter 2. Now here's what's interesting, is that it has been about 20 to 30 years between chapter 4 and chapter 2. Uh, uh, Wood's commentary states this, it says, Between the 30th and 35th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, when Daniel was between 45 and 50, uh, and when 25 to 30 years had lapsed uh, since the deliverance of the three three friends from the fiery furnace. It's a lot of F's in there. So I had to concentrate. So, uh, so it's been uh, 20 to 30 years from the second dream to the, uh, from the first dream to the second dream that we see in chapter 4. Now, also up front to know is uh, chapter 4 of Daniel. It's by Nebuchadnezzar himself. It isn't Daniel writing about Nebuchadnezzar, but it's from Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and so there was, uh, had to be some, uh, um, some talking that went into this and that, that, that an official state paper would be put into the, the scripture uh, and into this account. But it comes from Nebuchadnezzar himself, and we'll see that in the beginning and throughout the text and, and also at the end um, when he is restored uh, after what takes place in his life. So let's, let's dive right in. Uh, Daniel chapter 4. Let's, let's look at the first three, <clears throat> three verses. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So the first two verses, the king proclaims to God to all the world. Did you catch that? 
He says this is to everybody, to all peoples, nations, and languages in all the earth. So he is making this proclamation as king of Babylon that he says, listen, I want to proclaim something to you and I want all the world to know it. And he praises God, the one true living God. The second thing is found in verse 3, and that is that uh, the king proclaims God's sovereign rule. Notice he says, uh, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. He is going to do this four other times in the chapter where he declares this, the fact that God is, that he sovereignly rules and reigns over all the earth. And he's going to do that in verse 13, verse 27, and then in two different ways that he does it in verse 29. We'll see that as we work our way through the text. So let's dive into the king's dream and the interpretation that he had. The dream is found in verses 4 through 18. And we're just going to, again, we're going to read one verse or two verses and kind of just work our way down through the text. So let's begin with verse 4. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. Life was good. Right? That's what he's saying. See, he's, he's, he's just saying life is good. Things are going well. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, um, uh, when we get to verse 5, we'll see that, that, that uh, uh, in verse 4 he had security. He, he, had, um, uh, he didn't have a lot of worries going on at the moment. Life was good. And then you come to verse 5. And he says, I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So, so, so we go from verse 4 of life is good to with just one dream, that security is completely taken away. And it didn't matter about all the gold he had stored up somewhere. It didn't matter about all the, the hanging gardens that he had in Babylon. It didn't matter about all the other stuff that he had. That one thing completely took away all of his security that he had about who he was and about his kingdom. <clears throat> now notice verses 6 and 7 that he's going to call on uh, now just think about it. If we go back to chapter 2, um, uh, he, he calls on these same people again here in chapter 4. And, 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 and now I know it's been 20 to 30 years since it's happened. I get that. But these were major events in his life. Right? And so you would think that as he thinks back 20 or 30 years, he, you, know, that, that, you know, I had a dream some time ago. And I had to call on a certain person to help me with that. Because my sorcerers and my magicians, they couldn't get it done. And I had to call on that Daniel guy to do it. And now he's having another dream. And instead of immediately calling for Daniel, he just falls right back into the same mode. Because he had not learned from his lessons. So verse 6 and 7. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, or excuse me, then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream. They could not make known to me the interpretation. <clears throat> and so we come to verse 8 and 9, which is, well, my guys couldn't do it, so let's call Daniel. And that's what happens. Verse 8, at last, Daniel came in and before me, he whose name was Belshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and, my inter and the interpretations. Now, just pay attention to there's a phrase in there that, that de de describes who Daniel is, and it's the spirit... Uh, it is the spirit of the holy gods. We see that phrase in verse 8, in verse 9, and in verse 18. He uses it three different times. 
uh, in reference to Daniel. Now, uh, another translation may say uh, the spirit of his holy God, capital G. But what I want us to see is that he knew that there was just something different about Daniel. Because he is the only one that he could ever find to give him a correct interpretation of his dreams. Uh, so let's look at verse uh, 13, or no, I'm sorry, uh, 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 10 through 18. We, this, this brings us to the actual dream that he had. And we're going to read the whole dream. Now think about before we, just think about who Nebuchadnezzar is, all right? He is king of Babylon. He has ruled, he has reigned for like three decades or longer. Uh, he, is, he is known throughout all the earth, okay? And now think about those things as you listen to the dream. Verse 10. The visions of my head as I, lie, as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. And its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and top off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be uh, wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beast and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So a few things I want us to see. So I think as we look at that dream, we, we, we understand, I think we can see what that is. He, Nebuchadnezzar's the tree, as we're going to see here as it gets interpreted. Uh, he, he, his kingdom is it's, it's overflowing to all the ends of the earth and so forth. So I think that's... It's kind of, um, as I look at it, kind of self-explanatory when you think about who Nebuchadnezzar is. But I do want us to pay attention to verse, uh, just a couple of things before we move on. And that is found in verse 13. It says, And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. So who is this watcher and who is this holy one that came down from heaven and, and, and spoke these things, uh, uh, and it was what well, we would say it was, it's an angel. It's just an angel uh, that God sent to do that. Uh, and then verses 13, or 15 through 17, I, I hope you notice that there was a shift that took place because we went from talking about a tree that's non personal to almost talking about a person. Did you catch that? Look at this verse 15. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and let the tender grass of the field. Now look. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass and of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. And then the sentence is by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end of the living may, uh, living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets it over to the lowliest of men. One writer put it this way, the stump is personified as a sentient being that who would lose his reasoning, uh, his reasoning capacity and graze like an animal for seven years. This, it, it, there's a transition that takes place there in verses 15 through 17 from this tree, this 
inanimate object to a person. Okay? Uh, and that's because what is going to take place in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so, so let's drop down to the interpretation found in verses 19 through 27. Verse 19 says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered, and he said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Daniel was dismayed for a while. Now this did not mean that Daniel did not know the interpretation. Daniel knew the interpretation. But let's think about this. He wanted what was best for Nebuchadnezzar. He had been serving the king for over three decades. Or 20 years at least. It's likely that there, maybe there was a relationship, a friendship there with them after that long period of a time. Because remember, Daniel wasn't like this lowly governmental employee, right? He had been elevated in the kingdom. So I'm sure they saw each other quite often. Uh, and so here, and so Daniel is, uh, it's, it's like, I know what the news is, but I really, oh, I hate to have to tell you this kind of thing. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar speaks up and he says, uh, Daniel, listen, whatever it is, just tell me. Just, just whatever that is. Don't, don't, don't have fear about what I may do to you by giving me that interpretation. Just tell me what, what it is. Uh, Kyle's commentary said this, As Daniel at once understood the interpretation of the dream, he was for a moment so astonished that he could not speak for terror at the thoughts which moved his soul. The amazement seized him because he wished well to the king, and yet he must now announce to him a weighty judgment of God. So he begins the interpretation in verse 20 through 22. We learn what the tree is. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the ends of the earth or the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which uh, was food for all under which beasts of the field found shade and whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. Ah, uh, uh, it is you, O King. Does that remind you of anything? As I read this text this week, and I was reading through it, and I think through it, I, immediately there was something that came to my mind, and it's, it's, a, it's an account in the Old Testament. It's King David, right? When he was confronted uh, about his sin, and, and, and there in... Uh, and, and, he's, and he looks at David and he says, you are the man. In that same way, Daniel in this moment, I think, looks at the king and says, it is you, O king. It's him. Let's read on. Verses 23 through um, 26. Is, the, uh, is going to be God's judgment on the king. Remember, this is the interpretation, so he's getting ready to hear what's going to happen. Okay, Verse 23 says, And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree uh, of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you shall be driven from among the men, or driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall make 
shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. As it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from that, from that time you know that heaven rules. God's judgment is coming, Nebuchadnezzar. And he's just and God's judgment is going to do things that you could never, ever imagine. And why did it come? Well, mainly it's going, as we will see, it was pride. It was his pride. Now, Daniel gives a warning in verse 37. As always, there's a warning. There's a warning of God's judgment. He tells them this is what this is. But listen, I'm telling you, the way we would say it today, repent. Turn from your wicked ways, Nebuchadnezzar. Turn from your false gods, Nebuchadnezzar. Turn to the one true living God, Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what he warns him of in verse 37. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So he warns them. Just like we warn people today. Right? I know repentance is not a popular word. It's not a fun word. But we need it. We all need it. It's for the believer and the non-believer. And in a day of so much confusion of what is truth and what is reality and, and, and who are we as humans and all of those things, the best way to fix a lot of that is repentance. But we'll move on. So verses 28 through 37, what we see here is the king's humiliation and his restoration. Uh, The the humiliation is found uh, in verses 28 through 33. Notice verse 28 says, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. All this. Everything Daniel had said would happen, happens. Now we're going to look at what that, what that looked like for him here in just a second. But here's the pride. The king's pride is found in verses 29 through 30. At the end of the 12 months, so a year has passed from the time Daniel gave him the interpretation until this event. A year has passed. I wonder if he had forgotten. I wonder after about three months, he said, huh, nothing happened. Six months go by, nothing happened. Nine months go by, nothing happened. But what he doesn't realize is that's called God's grace in that time. That was God extending grace and mercy to him. But he did not listen, and he did not heed the warning. How many times have we talked with people, and we've warned people, and they did not heed the warning? That is Nebuchadnezzar right now. Let's look at verse 29 and 30. He says, At the end of the 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said... is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. The king's pride. First of all, mentions Babylon. Uh, I I wanted to read to you uh, uh, 
as one writer put it, about the city of Babylon. Now think about it. He's, he's overlooking the city, right? He, he's up in a, in, a, in a high position so that he can overlook the city of Babylon. And they said this, Babylon <clears throat> was probably the most famous city in the ancient world. Its huge walls may have been 40 feet high and 80 feet wide. So wide that several chariots could be driven side by side along the top of them. The city boasted wide streets, more than 50 temples and countless public buildings. The mighty Euphrates River flowed through it and gardens and palm groves, orchards and farmland dotted the countryside, providing enough food to feed the entire city. Gigantic shrines to Babylonian deities were set up everywhere. The pinnacle of the city's beauty, however, must have been the naturally naturally air-conditioned hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar had built for his homesick wife. Remember, the, that gardens was, it's one of the, the uh, seven wonders of the world. And that was built by Nebuchadnezzar. So as he stands and as he looks out over the city, pride sets in. And it's found in verse 30. He makes three statements in verse 30 that reveals to us his pride. He says... Is not this great Babylon which I have built? Then he goes on that it was by my mighty power. And he says it is for the glory of my majesty. It was pride. Now just think about what we talked about this morning at the, towards the end of the sermon where we were talking about Uh, how we are to live our lives, right? We are to live our lives for the glory of God. Not self. Nebuchadnezzar is saying it's it's for my glory because I'm the one that's done it. Now think about this. He didn't build one building. He had someone build that building. He didn't lay one stone on top of another. He wouldn't have planted one garden or anything else. He would have had someone else do those things. Yet he is saying and he's saying that he had done it. So let's look at how God's judgment falls. Verses 31 through 33. Now notice, while the words were still in the king's mouth. It's been a year since the interpretation was given. And while he is standing there in his pride overlooking what he thinks he has done, while the words are still in his mouth, notice what happens. There fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Now just think about this. If the dream scared him what do you think the voice did in that moment I have a feeling fear gripped him and I also have a feeling that immediately Daniel's voice came to his ears and verse 37 or verse 33 says immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nail were like bird's claws this is what they call lycanthropy 
lycanthropy. Scholars tell us that it comes from the Greek, which means from the word lycos, meaning wolf, and anthropos, meaning man. It's the idea of a wolf man. Lycanthropy stems from centuries-old belief that some humans can transform into wolves and re revert back to human form. That's just, that's not true. Just throwing it. It's just what they used to think. So, but clinical, uh, I can't, clinical lycanthropy is a psychiatric diagnosis of a person who believes he or she has become a non-human animal. Doesn't necessarily mean a wolf. the ruler of the world at that time was driven from his palace and for seven years lived like an animal because of pride. Pride comes before destruction. There's a reason, not only in Proverbs 16, 18 do we find that, but throughout the Proverbs, we find this warning, warning, warning about pride. Stay humble, the scriptures teach. And Nebuchadnezzar is finding out the all too reality of the power of pride. Seven years he was like that. Now, here's what's amazing. In that time, and we're, we'll, we'll see this as, we, as, he, as you look at the restoration, but I just want to go ahead and throw it out there a little bit. So, so here's what's amazing. Is, is the way we would think, right, if, if we had a man who is now living in the field, right? You drive by on Monday morning, and, and it's 5.30, and it's damp out there, and there they are, eating grass. I think we would come to the conclusion, I think we may need to get a new leader. Right? I mean, doesn't that just kind of make sense? He's kind of lost it. I mean, I'm not, he's kind of lost it. And, and, and we've got to move on. But here's what happened. Remember, God promised. He gave the word that he was going to be restored. That this was for seven periods of time. It was seven years. And that God would restore the kingdom back to Nebuchadnezzar. It didn't move on to somebody else. Right? It, it, it didn't, it, it was still there. And that's exactly what takes place when he restores him in verses 34 through 37. Let's look at verse 34. Again, it says, at the end of the days, that would be at the end of the seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. Stop there. Here's how I wrote it down. God humbled Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself before God. Now that could have gone two different that could have gone another way, couldn't it? That God humbled Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar raised his bony fist at God and said, "I'll never bow to you." But he didn't. God humbled Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself before a holy God. He understood who God is. And he understood that he himself was not a God. Let's keep reading. 30, 30, uh, 34. As I lifted my eyes to heaven. Now notice, the reason didn't come back until he lifted his eyes to heaven. As I lifted my eyes to heaven, my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. 
<clears throat> and his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generations or from generation to generation. All the inhabitants, excuse me, <clears throat> all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, and, my, and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. He is able to humble. Now, what I want us to see in verses 36 and 37 is the fact that God kept his word. This isn't about Nebuchadnezzar here. This is all about God in verses 36 and 37. Nebuchadnezzar is just the recipient of the fact that God keeps his word. So here's what we see. We see that he restored the king's reason he restored the king to his throne. He restored the king's officials and his, the administrators that he needed back to him. He protected the kingdom so that Nebuchadnezzar could have it back after those seven years. He restored the glory of the kingdom and added to it. And he restored the king's majesty and splendor to him. God keeps his word. Aren't you glad? God keeps his word. Just as he kept it in that day, he keeps it today for us. So we can trust his word. Dr. Graham Scroggy gave these uh, final thoughts about Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar is getting ready to go off the scene for us in the book of Daniel. So this is what he said. Here we take leave of Nebuchadnezzar and how does he bid us farewell? Not only as a sane man, but as a converted man. Now I know it's debated between theologians. Did Nebuchadnezzar truly turn or did he not? I think he did based off verse 34, that phrase where he lifted his eyes. I believe that was a humbling moment. But anyway, uh, the last thing related of him is the a uh, humble public confession which he made and the noble testimony to the true God with the restoration of his reason and kingdom that uh, came the regeneration of his soul. There is nothing in this book more sublime than this testimony of Nebuchadnezzar's. To him light came at eventide and he turned his throne into a pulpit and his state papers, which this is what this would have been, and he turned his state papers into sermons. I just kind of like how he worded that. He turned his throne into a pulpit and his state papers into sermons. That's pretty good. So what does this mean for us? What do we take away? How do we apply Daniel for our own lives? Let me give us four things real quick. Number one, remember this, that God has the power to humble us. We forget that, I think, sometimes. I do. We can get so caught up in our own little world that we forget that God really does have the power to humble us if he so chooses. Number two, that God loves us enough to humble us if we walk in pride. You do know that God loved Nebuchadnezzar. And God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know him the way Daniel knew him. And because God loved Nebuchadnezzar so much, he humbled him so that Nebuchadnezzar would lift his eyes to heaven and come to know the one true living God. Number three, that God uses, I love this, that God uses the humble to confound the wise or the strong. And what I mean by that is this, is that it was only Daniel who could give that interpretation. 
The astrologers couldn't do it. The magicians couldn't do it. The so-called wise men of that day couldn't do it. There was only one that God decided he's going to be the one that gives the interpretation of what I'm giving to Nebuchadnezzar. And it is my servant, Daniel, who has humbly served me for all these decades. And the last thing is this. Don't give up on someone who needs either salvation or needs to recommit themselves to Christ. Pray, love, pray, love. Because if Nebuchadnezzar can turn the heart of a king named Nebuchadnezzar, let me rephrase that, maybe come out right. If God can turn the heart of a king named Nebuchadnezzar, God can turn the heart of absolutely anybody. So don't give up. Keep praying. Keep loving. Because, as, you know, as my philosophy is, if they're breathing, there's hope. So do not give up on anybody. That's Daniel chapter 4. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for how, you have, how we uh, can look back at a life uh, of a man named Nebuchadnezzar and we can see how you were working and moving in his life. Lord, that you were working and moving for decades in his life. And we see what the result of that was. Lord, I pray for all of us who are your children, Lord, that we would truly walk humbly before you. That we would keep our eyes on you. Lord, that we would never look to ourselves. But we would always keep our eyes on you. Father, we pray for those of us who we have loved ones who either don't know you as Savior and Lord, Lord, or who have drifted. Lord, how we lift them up to you tonight. How we pray, Lord, that you would help us to not lose hope. That you would encourage our hearts to know, Lord, that if you're working in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar, that you are working in the hearts of those people, the people that we love. Help us to be faithful to pray. Help us to be faithful to love. Not to condone, but to love. Lord, we pray that you've been glorified in all that's been said tonight. Lord, we pray for not only our friends and family. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, those who are traveling. And we just pray that you'd watch over, that you'd care for those people. Lord, we lift them all up to you. Thank you again, Lord, for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for the hearts and lives that you're touching. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be salt and light as we go out to our places of work and school and uh, just all that we do this week. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.